Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Balsi. We are going to discuss a case today. Um, this case is going to be um, a case about the Hello, everybody. combination Balsi, of um, spine and the brain. Many of these patients come to us with uh, symptoms that are, are very diverse. And I'm just going to describe a case that I just recently uh, had. And in this case, practically, we are going to talk about um, the steps that I took to properly uh, investigate the patient and what the result of that was. Practically, this, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Pictures are on my blog, Neurosurgery Case Review. This is practically a patient who have come to me um, with some back pain, but more important than the back pain is that patients were reporting that he has difficulty walking. And uh, practically the main symptom is a patient uh, inability to um, ambulate properly. And it's not like He's weak. In my exam, I noticed that the strength is actually okay. Patient is reporting pain in the lower back and um, as well some radiculopathy, but that pain is not the main symptom that the patient is reporting that at the three to five of 10. So practically mild to moderate pain. And uh, at this point, you know, uh, I noticed that a patient um, reflexes are adequate, and uh, but patient has quite significant problem with the proprioception, and that um, literally uh, is uh, of a concern. Now, obviously, problem in the spine can cause uh, uh, a loss of proprioception, which, uh, if you look at the, the spinal cord, the model of the spinal cord, the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. Um, it, you know, if you cut the spinal cord horizontally, you see the butterfly, almost the butterfly figure in the spine. The posterior pathways are responsible for proprioception. But as you know, in the lumbar spine below L1, there is no spinal cord. We have cauda equina, we have the nerve root that are coming out, but practically problem of the, the proprioception and um, myelopathy is the problem of where the spinal cord exists, and that is L2 and above. So all these degenerative changes in the lumbar spine actually cannot explain problem with the proprioception. What can this finding explain? What you see here, it can explain obviously lumbar spine, axial pain, pain going down the leg where the nerve roots are going out, literally where the nerve roots in the lateral recess are going out, it can cause a problem with the uh, uh, sensory numbness tingling. And, um, and the patient in my exam had a specific symptom that was very concerning. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word ataxia. Practically that's incoordinated motion of all extremities. And obviously any finding in the um, lumbar spine cannot explain upper extremity ataxia. This ataxia was more pronounced in the uh, lower extremity than upper extremity, but patient has uh, ataxia in the entire spine and in the entire body. So um, practically, uh, I gave it away that in a situation like that, you want to look at the area of the spine that has spinal cord. And um, I'm going to just in a different window bring the anatomy of the spinal cord a little so we can talk about that. And here, I'm going to bring it over so we can share it with each other. And as you see, practically at L1, L2, the spinal cord stops and the rest below it is that cauda equina and for problem of the proprioception and for um, myelopathic picture, which is the first motor neuron, the pathology need to be in the L1 
one and above. So naturally I got the pictures from the spinal cord above the segment. So in the thoracic spine, there is really no compression of the spinal cord. And uh, in the cervical spine, there are some degenerative changes, some mild disc herniation, but really nothing that would as well explain patients a toxic picture. Now, the next step that we follow the first motor neurons, obviously the first motor neuron comes from the cortex, goes segmentally to the level that we just had a picture of that you would see the segment. Those segments of the spinal cord do not necessarily correspond to the segments of the bone. Because when you are born, those segments of the spinal cord exactly correspond uh, to the segment of the bone. But when we grow, bone grows faster than the spinal cord and practically spinal cord retracts. And uh, uh, so in, in, later on, they do not uh, correspond. I'm going to show it to you one more time here. Look at that. You see that, you see that here in the thoracic spine and lumbar spine, those, this, what the boxes you see are the segments of the spinal cord. When we are very little, practically when we are born, because the bone segments are smaller, this goes all the way down. But then when we grow, bone grows faster. Practically the spinal cord segment for L1, where the first motor neuron connect to the second motor neuron is actually for, in about in thoracic region and the last segment S1 and S2 is uh, this uh, spinal cord segment where connect to the second motor neuron of the S1 and S2 is actually at L1 bone segment. So let's go back and look at our, so here, I don't see any compression that would explain patient symptoms. But if we follow the motor neuron farther, we have to go to the brain stem and to uh, practically um, what we call midbrain and so on and so forth and basal ganglia. Let's look at that. I, so I ordered the MRI of the brain of this patient. Now, um, obviously I have that cursor there for a reason, but in this picture, which is a diffusion and that T1 sequence of the brain, you see, um, a small little asymmetry in brain. When you are reading every time the brain, um, yeah, obviously you have to know the anatomy, but um, and sometimes as well if the cuts are not exactly uh, the, uh, perfect, you may not have a symmetric picture. But more or less, uh, if there is an asymmetry, that's of concern. And you see, there is a small little. In the MRI, we call it hypo intensity. In the CT, we would call it hypo density here in this structure. I will come back to that, what this structure is. Here, you see in the diffusion that there is some of concern that there is a limited diffusion in this area for, the, for um, understanding Oh, I'm hearing that I'm on mute. That is, um, let me see, stop. I'm going to stop share for a second, see what the problem is. Let me see, yeah. Now, am I, am I, um, am I muted? Can somebody comment on that if you can hear me? Am I muted? Can somebody comment on that if you can hear me? 
actually I'm able to see on the YouTube live that I'm not muted. I'm actually, um, I'm able to hear myself on the YouTube. So I'm not muted. Uh, uh, Sahal Hussein, I think you're saying that I'm muted. It might be your, it might be your computer. So I'm going to, it seems that, you know, I'm able to hear myself. So I'm going to just continue, okay? I think you're saying that I'm muted. So um, here is the MRI of the brain in the chrono view. And let's talk a little about the anatomy here. Um, and uh, uh, Conrad uh, Kubicki, uh, are, you are able to hear me. I'm going to point to a structure just to check uh, our orientation. This structure right here, are you able to tell me what this structure is? I'm going around it. If you are able to see that, you see that is a structure actually outside of the brain. And this structure here seems to be a bone. There is a bone that has a, a part that goes up. This is the odontoid of the C2. And this is the C1, C2 um, lateral mass and joints. Here you see it, something that is almost uh, turns around. That is the basal or artery. Oh, okay, I stopped sharing because I was looking for my, why I'm muted. Okay, here, let's go back here. Now, now you're able to see that, okay? I'm back to the MRI of the, the brain. This is the T1 sequence in the coronal view. And now here, this is the structure I was talking about. Now, let's see here if uh, this the brain, this is the T. So practically, this structure is the odontite of the C2. Conrad, I am actually online. I'm watching my uh, YouTube. It seems that it is sharing now my screen. Are you able to see the MRI of the brain now? Okay, C2 dense. And just next to that, that is the joint between the C1 and C2. Just above the odontoid, do you see that structure that turns around like this? Conrad, do you want to tell me what that structure is? That is basal or artery. Okay. And then, obviously, we are able to see the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle. We see as well here that there is some space here in the top of the brain that, um, and that is by itself not of concern. But here in the diffusion imaging, we see a area that the diffusion is restricted. What do you think what that is? Can somebody just comment and tell me what you think when there is an area in the brain or any tissue that there is a diffusion restriction of blood, that's what it is. Do you know what we call that? If the area of the body that doesn't get enough blood supply? We call that, we call it stroke. So let's look at that here. Go back here. So, Let's look at the regular T2s now. These are the axial view of the brain. And this structure here, where we have in the T2, we have now a hyper intensity. When we have a hyper intensity in T2, that is a sign that the fluid is accumulating there. And, and this structure that fluid is accumulating 
Can somebody tell me what this structure is called right here? Obviously this, you see the foliae of the cerebell cerebellar region, cerebellum, you see how organized they are? You see the cortex of the temporal horn, you see the eye, you see the lens in the eye, and you see the optic nerve, and you see the muscle, intraocular muscle, and here is the cella turcica, right there, in front of this structure that I'm looking the name for, is again the basilar artery. There's a better picture of this structure here in the sagittal view. You see this structure, it looked like a bulb. It looked like a bridge. And that is where the name is coming from. Pons in Latin comes from bridge because that is a bridge between the spinal cord and the brain. We call that pons. It is a huge bulb. And there is a reason for this huge bulb because many of the signal that they go from the brain to the spinal cord and vice versa, they split there, exactly, it's pons, Conrad. They split here and a branch of that split goes to cerebellum. Now, why would our motor pathways split in the pons, make a huge terminal split there and send a branch to pons, uh, from the pons to cerebellum, you know? When you walk, you just walk. You don't think how to walk. Cortex is for things that are conscious. Like, you know, when you learn a new uh, sport, at first, you literally have to pay attention a lot about individual steps that you do. But then you don't think about that. You just do it. When you are thinking about that, how to do things, your cortex is very active, your brainstem, and your basal ganglia are very active, but then they incorporate those pattern of motion in your cerebellum. And then later on, your brain just says walk, you walk without thinking about it. That is a function of cerebellum that coordinate all the hundreds of muscles and thousands of muscle fiber in a way that you can walk without even thinking how to walk. To create that path, you need your basal ganglia and you need pons. Pons is practically a bridge, a, a terminal, a split station where conscious and unconscious meet and create those pathways for motor uh, action. Now, now that we are here, let's look at this a little more. This is a chronal, a sagittal view of your spine. I'm sorry, and uh, bottom of the uh, you know, brainstem, spine here and the brain. Let's familiarize ourselves a little. Here is your tongue. Here's your nose. Here is your uh, the sphenoid, uh, you know, and uh, uh, literally the, the uh, frontal sinus, and sphenoid sinus. Cella is not well visualized because it's not the exact cut. And you see the gyri of the brain. And here, and, and the back of the, you know, this is the third ventricle. In the middle is the third ventricle. Now, who can tell me on the back of the third ventricle, this structure that's almost hanging down, what is it called? Can somebody tell me what this structure is called that's hanging down? In the old age, some people thought, some philosopher thought that is the, where our soul actually resides. Some people, in some animal, it's closer to the um, skull and light can go through the skull and go on this animal and regulate the circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm. For, some, uh, for, for that reason, some people call it the third eye. It's a hypophysis, it's a pineal gland, okay? Pineal gland and the third ventricle, right above the pineal gland, here, the gyrus that is above it, it's called the single gyrus, okay? Exactly. So, um, and you see again the cerebellum. Between the cerebellum and the brain is the so-called tentorium. And it's harder to see in this image, but there is a hypointensity in the pons. 
So it makes sense in this patient that patient has ataxia. And if I just would have looked at the lumbar spine, I would have said, you know, nothing wrong with the lumbar spine, go. But the symptoms didn't really correspond to problem of the lumbar spine in that region. So I start looking further. And so I did find the pontine stroke that patient had, okay? That is why important to be conscious about the symptoms and what they mean. Now let's look a little at the anatomy and then we are going to call it a day. We are not going to do a very long case today. Here is the, the anatomical view of the pons and you see the organization, you know, you have fiber that are vertically, they come up and they are interspersed between the fiber that going horizontally. Here practically this fiber come from brain or spinal cord, then split a branch of that, they just make a turn and go to cerebellum to create those motion pattern, motor pattern, that's important to practically automatize the motion. Like if a, if a an athlete, if an Olympic athlete would think about what should do, they can never do what they need to do at that level if they have to think about it. It's more or less an automated by repetition and automated reflex. That's how they can perform at that level. Now, again, you see in a the larger view, I mean, obviously this is a very deep, uh, uh, very complex anatomy there. And forget about all the things that you see here. You don't need to know all of that, but you need to know that there are tracts that they come from brain or from the spinal cord and they are some fasciculation that they get the signal from those, those uh, from those signal that they pass through, they take that and they go and make a connection to our cerebellum. I wanna look at this a larger view of that as well, that you see the pons is exactly on the way from the, the cerebellum, cortico cerebellum, cerebral tracts and uh, where, send the signal to our cerebellum. And as well, here, a true anatomical view. And um, you see why it's called pons or bridge now. You see the brain and the spinal cord, the pyramidal tract, and here you see the pons. The tracts, they go inside, they literally pass through it. And you see those fasciculation, the horizontal line that take the signal from the pyramidal tract and other tracts turn around. And here you see the corner of the cerebellum right here. And those are how um, the motor functions are organized. So here, another schematic view of that. And uh, here you see again, the so-called the foli of the cerebellum. And you see that the cerebellar peduncles where the cerebellum is connected to the rest of the spine. And exactly on the other side of the peduncle, cerebellar peduncle is the pons. So let's um, just keep it at this point uh, uh, with this. We talked about um, spine and symptoms that don't correspond to that level. We talked about that uh, some of the anatomy of the, and how to recognize them in the MRI, different views. Now, a few the take home here. You need to be familiarize yourself with what these views are. Like this view is a, a, a T1. And the way I know it's a T1 is because the, the CSF in the ventricle is dark. This view, almost you could say it is a, a T2 because eyeball is white and the CSF seems to be white, but look at that, how distorted it is. A distorted view like that is usually not a T2. It is so-called the, the diffusion perfusion images where because of the limitation of the technology, it's always a little fuzzy. In contrast, I wanna show you a regular T2. You see how crisp the pictures are in the T2 and as well, let me show you a T2 picture of the brain as well. You see the pictures are very crisp. 
another thing that I think you know you should understand um, in the T2, where you see the literally the fluid. Um, in the T2, vessels are dark. Look at that. Do you see how this basal artery is dark? Because the fluid is passing so fast there, it doesn't have time to give any signal back. Whereas in I'm going to go now to a T1 view back. In the T1, the vessel seems to be hyper intense or white. Okay, these are a few things. Now, just to sum it up, uh, we talked about different views, how certain structure appear there, especially how a stroke or uh, area that's low perfusion appears there. Here, this uh, in the perfu diffusion perfusion, it appears uh, whiter, but in the T1 appears uh, darker, which we call hypo intense. <coughs> One last thing, the structure that you see inside of the ventricle. So can anybody tell what this structure inside of the ventricle it's called? Obviously this structure is where CSF is produced. So a choroid plexus, okay? Okay. Now I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, I will take, I know there is a little bit of a delay, so I wait a little and answer maybe one or two questions before call it uh, uh, a day for today. Exactly, Conrad. Good job, Conrad. Uh, you have been uh, uh, learning your anatomy well. But any question? There's maybe time for one or two questions. Uh, you have been uh, learning your anatomy well. But any question? There's maybe time for one or two questions. Okay. I don't see any question. Thank you for being with us for this case review. This case practically I uh, saw just this week and patient will uh, have to follow up with the neurologist. Obviously there is no neurosurgical uh, So yeah, Conrad, you're, you're a neurosurgeon. Excellent. So I'm um, uh, uh, actually um, connect to me and we can talk about uh, more about this case and other cases, but this specific patient uh, uh, doesn't have any neurosurgical needs. This is not a neurosurgical picture. We don't do surgery for people who don't know for stroke, pontine stroke. If there is a bleeding, then we obviously have deal with the bleeding, or if it's a mass effect, we deal with that. This patient is going to be referred to a neurologist, first of all, to find out why patient have a stroke, maybe it's a vascular problem, maybe with hypercoagulopathy, and eventually possibly get dealt with, with the uh, uh, reason, uh, like maybe patient need to be an aspirin or, or heparin or something else, or maybe uh, what are the other uh, you know, reason patient have, can have such a distinct uh, uh, stroke there. Um, one of the reason could be that patient has a heart problem or even heart infection, valve infection, that a piece of tissue shoots out of that area and clogs smaller vessel in the brain. These are practically a differential diagnosis that the neurologist will deal with and find out what's going on. Either way, uh, as a neurosurgeon, um, I will refer this patient to a neurologist for further investigation and will be only on the periphery following up with this patient. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and Conrad, uh, connect to me. At, uh, if you have more questions, then we can run few of these cases in a more in more depth 
some of them that are maybe even uh, the surgical cases because they are causing massive hurt. This is a high level neurosurgery, but uh, thank you very much for being with us and uh, have a good day, all of you. Have a great weekend.